we're continuing our series called uh, Reformation Starter Kit. And it's basically uh, six or seven lessons on the f- fundamental truths that you need to um, establish in your church if your church is going to have a healthy and a potent and a relevant culture. And uh, today is number two in that. And uh, we'll begin with 2 Timothy chapter 4. I don't have all my verses right here in front of me because I had to actually make all of these verses with my cell phone because I forgot my computer. But um, so I have some of them, some of them I don't, but Kevin has got my back. Look at 2 Timothy 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Now, I I believe Paul there is referring to an event that was uh, coming in the first century But it still applies. There are still times throughout all of human history where people cannot endure sound doctrine, endure sound teaching. What do they want? They want rather for their passions to be suited. They want their teachers and their preachers to be ministers of the status quo, to be ear scratchers, so to speak. Um, Give them what they want. And they're not able to endure. What does it mean to endure? To persevere through, to struggle with, to contend with over a sustained period of time until you come to understand. They're not able to do that. And they're not willing to do that. And I think we all would agree that the American church is marked by a lack of endurance of sound teaching. Amen? It is odd though, isn't it, that that sound teaching needs to be endured. But it does. If anybody has ever learned something from the Scriptures, new or difficult, and are there some difficult things to learn in the Scriptures? Yes, there is some endurance that is necessary. There really is. And I do believe that's ultimately a gift from God. But today is marked by uh, the inability to endure sound doctrine. And as a result, we are impotent, and irrelevant, especially to the larger culture at hand. And as a result, because of our doctrine not being sound and being filled with error, we gravitate towards what's natural, and that is to have a man-centered religion, a man-centered, Christless Christianity. Man-centered, therapeutic-centered, and uh, God becomes our butler who is there to serve our felt needs and that is epidemic in the american church and in the church of the entire west including europe and south africa and australia the church is impotent and struggling and um, this series is aimed at at recovering those teachings that sound teaching what are the sound teachings that need to be recovered first and foremost if a church is going to be healthy and vibrant and alive and powerful make sense Are you all ready? So today, the the doctrine is the centrality of Christ in salvation, which is to say not the centrality of man in salvation. Man's activities, man's inertia, man's initiative, man's decisions, man's uh, New Year's resolutions, man's needs, man's feelings are not central to the salvation of of man are not central to the gospel at all. What is central to the gospel is God. In particular today, we're going to see the centrality of Christ in the gospel. And if you preach a gospel that is that has man and man's needs and man's will and man's decisions and man's rituals at the center of it, you're not preaching a sound gospel. You must preach the gospel where Christ is over it, under it, on the right and the left, and in the middle of all of it. You'll see what I mean in a second. First of all, salvation beginning in the mind of God before the very foundation of the world when God the Father gave to the Son all those who would be saved. Let me say it another way. Those who are saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ are given to the Son by the Father. And it is a particular group of people in the mind of God given to the Son before the very foundations of the world. And if you have that truth in your mind, you can see right out of the gate that salvation is not man-centered, it's God-centered. It begins with God the Father in the eternal covenant with the Son, uh, giving as a gift to His Son the elect bride, 
Let me show you a few passages. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Who will come to Jesus? Who will walk the aisle? Who will be saved? Who will make a decision for Christ? Genuinely. All those the Father gives to Christ. Without any exceptions whatsoever. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Which leads us to our fifth point, which we'll get to in a little while, that Christ preserves those whom the Father has given to him. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The gospel is, the core of it is, the life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. What he came down here to do. But what is the purpose of all of it? Next verse. And this is the will of him who sent me to earth, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Meaning, not a single individual that the Father gave to the Son before the foundation of the world would Jesus lose, but, in, but he came to earth in order that he might not lose any of them and raise them up, raise it up on the last day. So you see the purpose of the gospel. You see the purpose of Christ's coming. You see that it all began with the Father's gift of the bride to the Son. Now look at John 6.44. <clears throat> No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Who comes, to the, who comes to the Savior? Who is saved? All those the Father has given the Son. Who comes to Jesus Christ in their life? Only those that are drawn by the Father. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 33. I'm sorry, John 6, 63. How is it that God draws us? How is it that we are able to come and others are not able to come? John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. All right, does everyone see this? The Trinity working in tandem, the Father gives to the Son, the Son is sent to earth to save those whom He has given, and in space and time, in your life, the Spirit draws you and gives you life in order that you might respond to the gospel call. Amen? Amen. Now, of course, this cuts against the grain of humanism, of the, the preeminent sin of the modern evangelical church, which is autonomy, in my opinion. Um, this cuts against that. It's incredibly offensive to modern man's ears. And so man cannot endure it. And they don't endure it. And rather, they, f they find teachers that will teach things that make... that scratch them where they itch, and, and meet their particular felt needs. Now, do you see the danger of doing that in a church? If you preach these particular things, people will have a hard time enduring it. And so Jesus says, many people cannot endure sound doctrine. But if you don't preach this, then what will end up happening? Well, sure, you'll be judged for it, but your message will become, rather than Christ-centered, and Trinitarian, it will become man-centered. And will that have an impact on the life and the culture of your church? Will that have an impact on your evangelistic techniques and your strategies and how you deal with disgruntled people or how you deal with squeaky wheels? Will this impact everything in your church? It will completely create a different culture, a different culture in the church and if the church is going to have any impact in society, it will create a totally different type of impact if you leave out the centrality of Christ. Let's look at Acts chapter 13, verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. See, as many, there is a numerical amount, and only those who are appointed to eternal life in their lifetime believe on the gospel. Amen? Right. But if, if this doesn't make sense to you in your mind, what should you do? You should believe what God says and repent of making your mind the Bible. Your mind is not the Bible. The Bible is the Bible. There, are, there is help to understand these things, but not if you don't believe you believe in order to understand. 
If you refuse to believe until God comes down and gives you a clarification that you will never believe and he will never do that. You must receive what he says. That's that. Amen. Let's look at Romans 8, 33, just fleshing this out a little bit more. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? You see, those are the elect. It is God who justifies. Colossians 3, 12, put on then as God's chosen ones. See, these are the chosen ones. As many as the father gave to the son, they are called in the Bible, the elect. That's the word for it. Or the chosen ones. Are they chosen because of something good in them? Because they are good decision makers? Because they're handsome or strong or mighty or mighty in great deeds, any of those things? No. When were they given to the Son? Before they were ever born, before the world began. It has nothing to do with us. Christ is central to salvation. It's in Christ, by Christ, for Christ. We are almost like an afterthought. We come later. All right, Romans chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. Man. Ephesians 1.4. Ephesians 1.4. Even as he chose us, right? see the us, that's the church. Paul's writing to the church. The letter of Ephesians is to a church. And God chose us in Christ. That is, in the mind of God, we were united to Christ in some way before the foundation of the world. For what purpose? That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. That is, he pre-established our destiny in order that we would be adopted to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. By Christ, for Christ, through Christ, etc. and etc. So if we if we put the sinner's decision or the sinner's compliance or the sinner's appreciation of at the center of our message, we will completely distort the gospel. It will not be the same gospel. Putting the sinner's decision or the sinner's faith as central robs God of his glory. It robs God of his glorious plan by making man the initiator. Um, Theologians and philosophers who are in rebellion against God um, say that God looked down the corridors of, of history way off into the future and he saw Aaron Vaughn, for example, choosing to believe him. And he said, I choose Aaron. That, and that teaching is nowhere in Scripture. That is a philosophical uh, deduction. And it is called Arminianism. And the entire church of the entire Western world, all of them, the entire Protestant Reformation, all of them came together and pronounced it heresy and banished the teachers. And yet today it is the dominant teaching of the American church. And what we are teaching here today, essentially by just reading passages, is seen as um, toxic. It's seen as toxic and counter evangelistic. No, I, it is not anti evangelistic, it is the gospel. It is the gospel, not the entirety of the gospel, but an incredibly important aspect of the gospel, that it is begun with God in Christ, period. All right, moving on to the next thing. Those who are saved are given to the Son from the Father, but then those given to the Son are then redeemed by the Son. Amen? John 17, 2. Since you have given him, that is Jesus, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. To whom does Jesus give eternal life? To those that the Father gave to him. No more, no less. All those that the Father in covenant with the Son gave to the Son, the Son then comes to earth to accomplish their redemption, to accomplish it. John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Who does Jesus lay down his life for? For the sheep. For the sheep. That's right. So is it true that we can say Jesus had you on his mind when he was dying on the cross? <laughs> yes. Right. Especially covenantally as the bride of Christ. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Tim Frazier. Hey. Remembering all those sins. <laughs> John 10, 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Who are they? Who are they? They are the sheep. Is it because they are good? Is it because they are better? No, not at all. Not at all. That would be, a, if you believe that, that would be to entirely miss the point of all of this. John 10, 15, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So why did Jesus Christ come into this world? To redeem all those the Father gave him. Did he accomplish that mission? Do you mean he made it possible for you to believe and for you to be saved? He did not make it possible for his sheep to be saved. He saved his sheep. He saved them. He accomplished it, which is why after he was uh, about to give his spirit up to the Lord on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. <clears throat> if he is the substitute, in which we all and we know that phrase, he is our substitute. A substitute, by the very definition of the word, Tags in that someone else has to take his place, right? A substitute doesn't make it possible for you to get out of the game, right? You're playing basketball, you need a sub, right? It, the substitute doesn't make it possible for you. He substitutes for you. He substitutes for you, right? <laughs> Moving on to the next thing. So all those that are saved, all Christians, from the beginning of time to the end of time are a gift from the Father to the Son. The Son comes into this world to redeem those sheep. He lays down his life for the many. That's them. But then, those to be saved are in time called by the Son. In your life, he calls you by the Spirit. I mean, he calls you. All right? Any questions before I go on? I feel like I'm going way too quick. I'm going to run out of, I'm not going to have anything else to say here in a few minutes. I'm just reading it. <clears throat> any other, any thoughts, any questions? Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't even think anyone should even ask that question. Really, you know, you don't, you don't, you want to judge. A, I know it's a rhetorical question, but yeah. I don't know. Can anyone remember when they first learned these sound doctrines? Jimmy's laughing over there. <laughs> it was a painful time in his life. Yeah. Does anyone else remember? Remember? No. The. It, made, it, makes, it can be difficult when you learn this particular truth that man is not center, God is center. And it, it, it really can become difficult for you relationally with other people. That's why it takes endurance to endure sound doctrine. There's something about sound doctrine that people resist. And uh, it's unfortunate. It really is unfortunate. Brother Henry? That's the bowl of allergy. You know, when the substitute comes in, and scores, that substitute gets the glory. And the whole team wins. Amen. That's right. If you're wearing the same uniform as him. Yeah. Amen. We could go on with that analogy for a long ways. <laughs> when the priest entered into the holy place, he, was, he wore on his breastplate, are you all familiar with this? Twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel. As the high priest entered in, he first, he was washed, he offered the sacrifice, he went through, past the altar, into the Holy of Holies to offer the blood on the Ark of the Covenant in order that the people he represented might be atoned for, that God might dwell with them and be their God and they be his people. Those 12 stones represented Israel, not anyone else. 
all those who are united to Israel, all those who were in covenant with Israel, the circumcised, even if they were Gentiles, like Ruth or Rahab, you had to be in Israel for the high priest to represent you. The high priest did not represent the Toltecs when he went into the, high, the uh, Holy of Holies. A high priest represents his people, and there is a set number of them. And that, of course, is all an analogy or a, a type of how Christ would come to die on the cross representing his people as the sacrifice, then enter into the heavenlies as our high priest to offer up his sacrifice as an atoning sacrifice. And when he did that, your salvation was accomplished. The, the, the ground of your salvation was accomplished. There was still much more work to be done by the Spirit in space and time, but the ground of your salvation was accomplished. Uh, Tori. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I'm a little late on the question thing, but... No, you're fine. I think the hardest thing Carter's thinks to me to accept, at least in my perspective, not accept, but the hardest thing about the truth is that the reality is, is that you will, you know, in a world where you know, it's got common grace and people that find it warm and fuzzies by calling themselves Christians, yet they follow even the songs of the and whatever, that that will always have to exist if you, if, in order to, I mean, not everybody can be reformed. I mean, can those that are not called believe in this? Is it possible for them to have even understanding of it? It's possible for a non-Christian to read these verses and know what they say. It actually is sometimes easier for non-Christians to read the verse and be like, I know exactly what it's saying. I don't believe any of it, but I know exactly what it's saying. A lot of Christians either don't read these verses or rationalize them away in some way because it's just so... Um, damning to their tradition or to the way they've thought their whole life and that can be very when you have to change something like that it can be it can cause a lot of anxiety in your life yeah they can still be a christian fortunately we're saved by the grace of god alone and not because we have all this figured out uh, but it is but you reap what you sow if you refuse to believe certain passages of Scripture, it's going to have a negative impact on your life and your generations to come. And if you sit under false teaching for a long period of time, it's going to have a negative impact. You, God will not be mocked. And uh, so you can still go to heaven. I mean, it, salvation is not of a man, but is of God. But um, what we want is to be really fruitful and potent and relevant for the world and for the church, which is why we want to make sure we have have our doctrinal ducks in a row. Make sense? I mean, uh, you think it's, if your mind is not renewed, if you have messed up thinking, which we all do to some degree, and um, probably comes and goes to some degree too, that's going to impact the way you live. going to impact the way you do church, the way you worship, the way you evangelize, the way you raise your children, all of the above. <clears throat> all right, good. Those to be saved are, in time, in their life, going to be called by the Son. Matthew eleven twenty five. Let's look at this. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. The Father hid things from people. And Jesus thanked the Father for hiding things from people. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. You see that? The Son has to call you in your life. The Son, Jesus Christ, from his throne, sends the Spirit to you to beckon you to open up your eyes, to, to give life to your dead soul. You know, a Christian is not someone, essentially, who is just a better version of themselves. It is someone who has been uh, killed and resurrected by the power of the Spirit of God on the inside. They have new spiritual eyes and new spiritual life. They're not just more mature than they were as a kid. Amen? Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Jesus did not call them. Jesus did not reveal himself to them. 
John 17, 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Who does Jesus manifest the Father's name to? Only those that the Father has given him. That's right. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Amen. Amen. John 17, 8. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. You can see the very clear teaching of Scripture. Jesus does not pray for the world, but only those from the world that the Father has given him. So who believes and receives the word? The ones given, the ones redeemed, and the ones that have had the truth revealed to them by the Spirit, by the Spirit of Christ. Others cannot perceive these things because they are spiritually perceived. They not only will not, they cannot because they have not had their eyes opened by Jesus Christ. This is why when the Bible speaks of Lydia, there was a little ladies Bible study going on down by the river and the Apostle Paul and others came to them. And the Bible says of Lydia, it says that the Lord opened up her heart in order that she might receive the things spoken by Paul. You see the initiation. You see all of that. This is why the Bible says that repentance is a gift from God. This is why the Bible says that faith is a gift, Ephesians 2.8. Right? And these sort of passages are over the entire Bible. And when, when you see this, it will be like a light switch flipped on. There's a lot of things like that in the Scriptures. The light switch goes on, and all of a sudden you realize, I have to read the Bible over again, right? <laughs> I, have to re- I have a lot to learn. I can't believe I thought I had just about figured it all out, right? This switch comes on. When you see the centrality of Christ in salvation— and, the, and what we talked about last week, the sovereignty of God over all things, including the salvation of man, it is a worldview paradigm shifter, and it will um, completely change your life and your family and your church's um, uh, culture. It, it doesn't mean that this is how you get saved. You don't get saved by knowing this particular thing. This, you learn these later on in your Christian life. But this is something that if you refuse to believe is going to have a negative impact on your life. Um, moving on to the next one, those saved by the Son are kept by the Son and preserved by the Son. John 10, 28. And this is the last, uh, last point I have, so if you have any questions, jump in. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Who are those that will never perish? The, who are those who will never be snatched out of, out of the Son's hand? Those whom the Father has given him. So you can see the connection before the foundation of the world, the Father gave to the Son, then in space and time 2,000 years ago, he sent the Son into this world to redeem those particular people. Right? Does anyone know the technical term for that? Well, he did offer up a propitiation, but particular atonement would be a word for it. He atoned for a particular group of people, the elect, all those that the Father sent him. Then, upon his throne, he begins to pour out his spirit. And in 2,000 years later, in 2023, at some point in your life, he poured out the spirit upon you when you were dead in trespasses and sin and caused you to have the ability to see and to receive and to hear and to have life. And he will never allow you to, be per- to perish. He will preserve you to the very end. Are you participating in this? Of course. Sanctification and growth and endurance is a participatory thing, but he is going to ultimately be the one that preserves you. And honestly, over the course of my pastoral ministry, it has been interesting to see those whom the Father rejects and those who he calls, it's impossible to predict. 
It really is impossible to predict. Whom you would look out and be like, oh, that, they would make a great Christian. And they never come to the faith. And they hate it. And then other people you think, wow, what a, an amazing turn of events that they are saved and those other people are not saved. Have you ever <laughs> thought that? Uh, hopefully you think about it about yourself, right? But uh, it is, he, he surprises you sometimes. All right, John six thirty nine. And this is the will of him who sent me, the Father sent Jesus, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day, in the resurrection. That's why the book of Hebrews says that he can save us to the uttermost. Right? 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, which is why I suffer as I do, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Amen? So, um, considering perseverance of the saints, it, we do not believe here at Christ Church, we do not believe that you can lose your salvation. Right? You cannot lose, if you are truly elect, you cannot lose your salvation. And we also don't believe what is called once saved, always saved. Now that, is, don't, if you are truly saved, you will always be saved. But that phrase is a, is a uh, technical term. It's like a nickname for a belief um, that we call, I think more properly called the carnal Christian doctrine, that you can, you can make a decision at some point in your life in a church service, however they got you to do it. And they have their techniques because they don't believe this. They use technique to engineer salvations and to engineer momentum and buzz and fill the baptistry because they don't believe in this, right? And so they engineer these these emotional events where everyone is carrying little TVs and swaying back and forth with their boyfriend, Jesus. Um, that's, this is Arminian culture. And they sway daddy, daddy God, and they have, and they have just a, like a, a cathartic moment with their personal Jesus. And it's like a thousand people having a personal cathartic moment in the same room all at the same time with their eyes closed. And like, you know you're in a room with a bunch of other people, right? It's called a congregation. You're not, like, you're not in a yoga class. And they do this until a long period of time, until people get emotionally whipped up. And some churches are more... Uh, did someone say gross? <laughs> Aggressive, yeah, and gross. Some, some keep it in the pocket, like depending on if they're going for white middle class or if they're going for like redneck country folk, depending on their target market, which they literally call it, their target market, they will keep it in the pocket to make sure it stays culturally palatable for professionals. You know what I mean? Professionals don't want to roll around on the floor, um, not usually, but a good tidy good tidy uh, cathartic moment and you get the swell going and you sing songs that are all about the inside of people's feelings and anxieties and and very vague and so that what that's doing is it's trying to get the person to come to a crisis point a crisis moment that's the technical term for it and when you create that crisis event and there's different ways to do it then that person is provoked to make a decision for christ and then there will be a ritual involved where you can publicly make that decision, usually involved um, coming up to the front of the church and, and crying and doing some filling out a card and some things like that. But um, all of that is Arminian. All of that is uh, engineered stuff. It's all engineered. Um, if, you are, if you are teaching that, one of the difficulties is that a lot of these people um, go on to live like the devil still. They don't actually, they're not being sanctified. They're not abiding in his word. They're not his disciple. They bounce from church to church every few months. They're always the boss of themselves and everything. They don't have any other accountability or elders or anything in their life. Their marriages are in shambles. And what the, the, way, you did, the way you handle that is you say, well, they were saved that moment. They made that decision. But even, and even though they're not living in not living like a Christian, we still, you know, we still know that they're saved. And that's called the carnal Christian doctrine, or once saved, always saved. We do not, that is not true. If you are given to the Son, He came into this world to redeem you. He sent the Spirit into your life to give you new eyes to see, and He is preserving you. 
Amen? And keeping you and sanctifying you until you die. Right? Now, you might have some bad moments like David, right? But there will be some repentance and a return to the faith. All right? That's called the perseverance of the saints. That's the technical term, and that's the way you should think about this. And we believe that because Jesus Christ promises that he's going to preserve those, um, allow the, give the grace to those whom he loves to persevere. So anyway, all of these various things, you are not proclaiming the gospel in its full if you don't proclaim Christ at the center of it. And if you want your church, whoever's listening on this podcast or any of y'all, maybe you're going to be pastors or church planners one day or even your own family. If you want your family to be potent, to be powerful, to do great deeds for the Lord, right? You have to have the gospel right. That is the, found, that is the foundational thing. And that includes the centrality of Christ over salvation. Amen. All right, four minutes. Any questions? Any questions? No? Have you ever talked to somebody about this for the very first time in their life and felt that anxiety inside your own heart? More than once. It, it's, it's, try, we'll try doing it for a living in front of a bunch of people all the time. <laughs> but it is, not just, just a complaint, but anyway. <laughs> It is very hard to teach this particular truth. I've gotten accustomed to it over the years, but if you're talking to someone that you love and you really don't want them to be upset with you or to think that you're a weirdo, right, which is more likely, um, you round off the edges. But you, if you round off this, you don't, you don't go from a Christ-centered salvation to neutral, to neutral. You go from a Christ-centered salvation to a man-centered salvation and you rob glory from Christ. And so you have to be faithful to this truth. All right, well, y'all have a great Lord's Day.